Let's look at how to get started with NativeScript. The first thing you need to do is set up your development machine, and you'll find the appropriate instructions based off your machine's operating system here. Regardless of your OS, the first thing you'll need to have is Node.js installed, as that's the platform that the NativeScript CLI runs on. From there, your requirements depend on the platforms you want your apps to run on. For Android, you'll need to have a JDK installed, you'll need to have an Apache Ant installation to run builds, and an Android SDK as well. For iOS, you need to have a Mac that has the latest Xcode and the Xcode command line tools. Now, if you get a bit overwhelmed by these requirements, or if you're on Windows and you want to build iOS apps, you might be interested in using NativeScript as part of Telerik App Builder, as it provides an environment that performs builds in the cloud, which removes the need for you to take care of these system requirements. If you're interested, you'll want to check out these links here, as they walk you through using NativeScript as part of App Builder. But for the rest of this video, I'll be discussing using NativeScript with the NativeScript CLI. And to do that, I'll head over to my terminal. You install the NativeScript CLI from npm using the npm install command. This creates two commands, NativeScript, which you can run to see a giant list of tasks available, and TNS, which stands for Telerik NativeScript and maps to the exact same thing. Next, you create projects using the TNS create command. I'll create one named demo. By default, this scaffolds out a little sample project. To run it, you first need to run the TNS platform add command for each platform you intend to support. This command uses the native SDKs in your development machine to create a platform-specific project for your app. For instance, an Xcode project for your iOS app. I'll run this for iOS and for Android as well. We'll dig into how these files are stored and work momentarily, but first let's see what this app looks like. You run native script apps with the TNS run command. You can run on a USB connected iOS device, a USB connected Android device, the iOS simulator, if you pass the dash dash emulator flag, an Android emulator, just replace iOS with Android here, or even a Jenny motion Android emulator with the dash dash Jenny flag. Let's start with the Android emulator. While this is running, let's take a look at what the source code for this application looks like. At the top level, native script projects contain two directories, app and platforms. The platforms directory starts empty, but that's where the files from the platform add command are placed. So if we dig into Android here, you can find things like the Android manifest and you'll find APKs in here. For iOS, you'll find things like your Xcode project. The app directory contains your application code, including your development files, your app resources with things like your splash screens and icons, and TNS modules, which are a collection of NativeScript provided modules that you use as part of building your NativeScript apps. Let's start in app.js as it's the starting point of your application. If you've done any Node.js development before, or even if you've just used a Node-based task runner such as Grunt and Gulp, this require call may look fairly familiar. And that's because native script modules adhere to the same common JS spec as Node modules. So if you're familiar with Node, you're gonna feel right at home in native script. If you're not familiar with Node though, this is pretty easy to understand. In this case, this require command is requiring the application module, which happens to be a TNS module, and you can find it, its implementation in here. In this case, this file is just saying, I need to use the require module, I need to set its main module or the initial starting page of my application to main page, and I need to start the app. Because of this line here, control is then passed to these main page files here. Let's start in the UI declaration, which is in this XML file. Now, I know what you might be thinking, XML, ugh. And yes, XML has gotten a bad name because it's a pretty horrible way to store data or to house data structures, but it actually is a really elegant way to define a UI. I'm gonna show you what this page looks like momentarily, but before I do, I think you already can get a pretty good idea. The first thing within the page tag is this stack layout element. This is one of the four or five layout methods that native script provides. And it's also the simplest. Stack layout just says stack things up, either horizontally or vertically. Vertical is the default, so this is just gonna stack up a label, a button, and another label on the screen. And if I drag over my Android emulator, you can see that that's exactly the case. The other thing to note is this double curly brace syntax. Now, if you're a C-sharp developer that's done XAML before, or a front-end developer that's done any sort of templating solution, Angular, Ember, that sort of thing, this syntax is probably going to look familiar, and that's because this is actually NativeScript's data binding implementation. To see how this works, let's bring up the logic behind this page, or the JavaScript file. And in here, there's two things I want to call your attention to. The first thing is this use of this exports keyword. This is, again, if you're a Node developer, this will already look familiar. If you're not, the export keyword is just a way of exporting or defining what your module's public API will be, or what properties and methods you're exposing to modules that consume this module. In this case, we're saying that the page loaded function should be exported, and that actually corresponds to this loaded attribute on the page element. 
What that function actually does is set the page's binding context, or sets an object that should be used as the basis of data binding. The object it sets it to is retrieved from this, again, require call. In this case, it's bringing in this view model. And you can see the tap action function corresponds with the tap event on this button, and the message property corresponds with the message being shown in this label. This data binding approach is cool for a couple of reasons. The first is that it lets us separate our concerns. Our JavaScript logic here doesn't need to know anything about this XML structure. It's just dealing with JavaScript objects and letting the UI take care of itself. Because as you'll see in this example, as I click the button, this message property automatically updates. I think this is particularly cool because these are native UI components. There is no web view here. There is no DOM. So this data binding is actually happening between JavaScript objects and these native controls. Let's look at one more example of this. I'm going to go ahead and add a task.xml file and a task.javascript file as well. This is another example that I think really shows the elegance of NativeScript's XML syntax. Because again, before I show you this, I think you can get a pretty good idea of how this works. In this case, I'm using a grid layout, which basically gives me a way to divide the screen up into rows and columns. In this case, I'm saying use two rows. Those rows should have a height of auto or as much height as they need and star or as much height as left. I'm saying in the top row, put a stack layout as you can nest these layout implementations. In this case, override the default of a vertical orientation and place these controls horizontally or put a text field and a button next to each other at the top of the screen and then place this list view on the bottom. I'll head back into my app.js and in this case I don't want to start on the main page. I'm going to start on the task page as well. Head back to my terminal, go TNS run. This time I'll run it on an iOS simulator using the dash dash emulator flag and I'll drag this over here and you'll see grid layout Two rows, the stack layout here, text spot, text field and button next to each other, and the list view on the bottom of the screen. This example has another cool implementation of the data binding approach. Again, note the export syntax to expose these functions for the XML to use for the loaded event here and for the tap event on the button. But what I think is really cool is the data binding being done on an array. In this case, task, which is mapped because of this binding context call here, to an observable array, which is just another TNS module. The elegance of this approach is that when I want to add an item to the list, all I have to do is call push and let the rest take care of itself. Now you may notice this button looks kind of big and the spacing here is kind of off. And to change that, we can use NativeScript's CSS implementation. NativeScript uses a subset of the CSS language that gives you the ability to style these native controls. In this case, this button is so big because this app.css file, which contains CSS rules to apply to all pages in your app, defines this button size as being pretty big because it works really well for this sample, but it doesn't work quite so well for our task demo. Now, I could either add some new rules here or configure some CSS class names, as you see. This message class name, for instance, corresponds with the CSS class attribute used in the sample page. But in this case, I'm actually going to create a page-specific CSS file using the same naming convention that we saw for JavaScript and XML files. I'll add a bit of margin, and I'll bump down that button size a little bit. Head back to my command line, run this thing in the emulator again. And you can see that the spacing looks a whole lot nicer. Now this project makes for a really good example of NativeScript's ability to give you to write a cross-platform app from a single code base and to use NativeScript's cross-platform modules to do it. You'll see that throughout this code, there's not a single check where I have to fork my code to deal with Android and iOS separately. But when you do need to do that, NativeScript makes that elegant as well. So I'm going to switch over to another project I wrote dealing with maps and open that up. This app actually uses two different views, a list view, which is not platform specific, and a details view that is. I'll briefly show the list view, although it uses syntax you've already seen. A grid layout to lay this page out, and a list view that contains an array that this is bound to. I'll show the JavaScript briefly because there's one cool thing I want to point out. Since NativeScript modules are just JavaScript, there's no reason you can't use other JavaScript libraries that you would like to use to build your apps. And this list page, for instance, I need to display dates, and I'm using moment.js to format the dates up. And if I run this, you can get an idea of what that looks like. Now, not every NPM module is going to work, specifically ones that depend on the DOM being available, because there is no web view, there is no DOM as part of NativeScript apps. But utility libraries such as moment.js or underscore or lodash can really help you build your NativeScript apps.
like I said, all of this code is cross-platform. It's gonna work exactly the same on Android. I use the navigate method down here to transfer control over to the details view. And you can immediately see just by looking at the files that there's two different sets of details files here. This .ios and .android naming convention is something that NativeScript provides as a way to let you fork your code as you need to. NativeScript is smart enough to use those files when your app is running on that platform. That is, on iOS, NativeScript is going to use the details.ios.js and details.ios.xml files. And on other platforms, it'll fall back to the non-qualified details.js and details.xml file. In this case, the reason I forked my code is for iOS, I actually wanted to tie into the native mapping system. I wanted to use the MK map view APIs to show native maps in my app. And if I bring up my app here, you can see that these apps actually look and behave quite nicely. Here's Sophia, and I'll switch over and show one more city as well. And I'm able to do this because of the way that NativeScript provides access to these native Objective-C APIs. You can see that I can tie into this API, including uh, showing a place with a latitude and longitude that I'm getting from my backend in about seven lines of code there. For Android, my implementation is far more simple. I'm actually just grabbing an image from the Google Maps static maps API and throwing that on the screen. And if I switch over to the Android emulator, I loaded this in earlier. You can see definitely less appealing, but this implementation does work. Eventually, I wanna come back into this and actually bring in the Android Google Maps SDK and implement a native Android solution as well. But to me, the architecture of this app shows off the real power that NativeScript provides. For things that you need to just work cross-platform, for simple things like lists, like this app uses here, you can build them in a cross-platform way. But when you really need to dive into the native stack, when you need to provide a very specific implementation for the platform, you can do so. I built this map in a handful of lines of code. And even when you do this, even when you fork and create these platform-specific views, you're still sharing a bunch of the code. Even with this implementation, I don't have to rewrite my model data where I'm using to represent these places or the backend that actually goes and retrieves this data from my database. And to me, all of that makes for a really robust way and really powerful way to structure your mobile apps. From here, make sure to peruse the rest of our API documentation and reference material as there's more than I had time to cover today.